We're going to take. We're going to continue our journey through the book of uh, Corinthians, which is the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Which that letter applies to all the church from then and now, because the words of God came through the Spirit to Paul for every disciple in Christ. These letters are written specifically for disciples of Jesus Christ. Technically, it's written for all believers, but you have to actually be a disciple if it's going to mean anything to you. A lot of believers in Jesus don't care about any of the letters. But true disciples care about what the Lord Jesus would say to us now. And so that's why we do this. We go through every word, uh, and then we say some things about lots of them so that we can hear the same thing that the early church heard, so that we can be as good as the early church in the way of righteousness, in the way of understanding, in the way of new covenant realities, in the way of Christian works, which if we're going to do anything for God that means anything, we're going to have to get it straight from God and do it His way. Right. We're not after man's goals. We're not after man's visible success rate. We're after God's success rate, which He has lined it out. He's laid it all out in Scripture. That's what pleases Him. That's the, we've got the answers to the test right here. All right? We've got, the, we've got the answers. We have the guideline. We have the road map to, to spiritual success right here in this Word of God. And a Christian needs to know his Bible real well. The whole Bible. You need to know the whole Bible real well. And you need to live in the New Testament real well. Amen. So we're in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have this ministry... We have a ministry... Yeah. Yes. We all have a ministry. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I guess y'all want me to say something. You want me to say something about that part? Uh, notice here it says, therefore. So you can't really just start in chapter 4, verse 1, because it says, therefore. That means it's referring to something that's already been spoken of. So it's in context already. Now, we did this last week, so we don't have to go through the whole thing. But chapter 3 talked about the ministry of the New Testament in comparison to the Old Testament. The Old Testament was called the ministry of condemnation. Verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9, ministry of condemnation. And it was called the ministry of death, verse 7. That's the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments plus all the law of Moses and the prophets was called the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. All it did is make you feel bad. All it did was show everybody what to do and then prove that they couldn't do it. Therefore, they had to kill animals because no one could keep the law properly. Then he says, but there's a new ministry. There's the ministry that exceeds much more in glory, which is the new covenant, verse 6, made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. So listen, listen, how does this apply to us? It applies one way in that you and I don't need to listen to those who try to bring up the old covenant as relevant today. Amen. 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 You have to be very careful because some people will take, because it's the Word of God, they'll take it and say, see, you've got to keep the Old Testament too. No, no, we love the Old Testament. We need the Old Testament because the Old Testament is our blueprint. For the New Testament. Isn't that right? Yes. Amen. We build a church building. We first need a blueprint. We build the church. And we live not in the blueprint. Come on. Right. We live in the reality right. of what the blueprint yeah. designed. Glory. Where does that blueprint go after you move into the real deal? <laughs> you roll it up. And then for the next 50 years, it's like, where, where's that blueprint at? I don't know. I, think I hadn't seen that in years. Why? Because you don't really need it. You're living in the reality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's good. As you know, the Old Testament was a type and a shadow of things to come, which of things now we're living in. The Old Testament was a type and shadow of the New Testament. Amen. Lord. It was the preparation for the New Testament. Yeah. Now, 
It doesn't mean we throw away. Nobody throws away their blueprint. Isn't that right? And that's why Paul said very specifically, he said it's becoming obsolete. It's not thrown away. It's still there in the drawer or the closet, hidden away collecting dust, just in case you want to go review and see where that electrical wire is. Just in case you want to see how it's built. Somebody, the, the property owner over here, just gave me the blueprints for the the buildings that are on the property right now, the house and the barn. It's got all the specifications, and I looked at it and thought, well, this could be necessary for somebody someday if we had to refurbish or understand how these were built for some reason. I'll roll this back up in case we need it one day. That's what the Old Testament does for us. It helps us see some of the design that was planned by God before the New Covenant. All right. That's why we keep it in our Bible. It's valid for understanding things, for principle, and for all good things. Uh-huh. Yeah. The New Testament is called a better covenant made upon better promises. Amen. Yes. The New Covenant is better. Amen. Well, in order for the New Covenant to be better, it has to at least be as good as the Old Covenant. So every good thing passed through to the New Testament. But every other thing that's kind of confusing like fire came down from heaven because they sinned and spoke evil of someone. The earth opened, leprosy hit, all of these cursed things stopped at the cross. I don't know. I mean, you got to know this. And that's why you read the Old Testament. It's like, oh man, God did that. And wow, look at God. He's, he's serious, man. I mean, he's a punisher. Yes. That's why Jesus was so necessary. That's why Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us so we don't have to be cursed anymore. you got to understand that that's the big deal. That's why the curse stuff did not pass through the cross. That's a whole other teaching, but I just want to give a recap of what ministry he's talking about. Paul's talking about the ministry of the new covenant, which is in Christ, which is in the blood of Christ, uh -huh. which is in the righteousness of God through Christ and not works and law. Yes. Glory. Glory. The glory of this righteousness by faith alone is so much better than righteousness by the law. Yes. It's so much better. Yes. So much better. Yes. And that's what Paul's saying. Now, this was hard for Jews to hear. This was very hard for the, the, the Israelites to hear. Pharisees had a hard time with this. Those who were familiar with the law of Moses had a hard time with Paul's ministry. Mm -hmm. All right. Today, some Christians have a hard time with Paul's ministry. You start talking about the Ten Commandments being called the ministry of death, it's like they want to erase that passage out. Oh, no, let's erase that out. Let's ignore Chapter, th uh, uh, chapter 3 here, the truth is it bothers a lot of people who are stuck to rules and religious orders. Come on. All right. Come on. If that's what you think Christianity is all about, you won't really like Paul's ministry. Amen. The Old Testament had this theme of the merit system. You do good, you get blessed. You do bad, you get cursed. We understand that, right? Humans are almost okay with that. I do good at work, I get a promotion. I do bad at work, I might get fired. I do good in the, on the team, I get to play. If I don't do good, I get benched. It's called the merit system. We're rewarded for our good things and our bad things. Mm, we're apprehensive because we know that there might be some repercussion. That's an earth system. It's the merit system, but it's not God's new covenant system. Come on, Thank you. New covenant says... You did a bad thing, but I'm going to give you mercy anyway. Glory. New Covenant says, you don't really deserve a good thing. I'm going to give you a good thing anyway. It's like, wait. And that's why we look around thinking, now wait a second, I thought I was better than that Christian. That's a brand new baby Christian. They don't even know all the rules yet. And look at them getting blessed. <laughs> That's why it's hard for us. It's like, wait a second, I want them to be punished somehow. If they've sinned, I want them to get what's coming to them. And, and, and then God says, but what about the cross? I paid for that sin. Amen. 
And that's why sometimes we do it to ourselves. We, we almost feel like we ought to be punished for what we've done. We almost would rather walk with a backpack of condemnation than really accept the free mercy that God gave us through Jesus Christ. It almost makes us feel guilty. I see how some of y'all are looking at me like, oh, is this from the Bible? Is this from the Bible? Yes, yeah, from the Bible. That's what we're doing, Bible study. And if you do Bible study, you're going to run into this stuff. You're going to have to deal with it. Amen. All right, now, if you're a little, still a little uncertain, then you have to get last week's message. We covered it in more detail Amen. with more scripture. All right, so let's move along here. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy... We do not lose heart. So Paul is boasting about the mercy he's gotten from God. Mm -hmm. Certainly, certainly Paul, the killer of Christians, he's known as the killer of Christians. And all he can say is, well, I got mercy. With a big smile on his face. I think he was smiling. As we have received mercy. Paul got mercy for killing Christians. You need to give mercy to your fellow Christian for the smaller things they've done. Amen. All right. Verse 2, But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Boy, that's just an interesting way for a preacher or a Christian to think about it. First of all, Renouncing the hidden things of shame, there, there is an element of us stiff-arming the works of the devil. Acknowledging evil and wickedness is not part of the Christian life. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully. That's done many times. I mean, you can turn on the TV and see it. You might have been in a church where that you felt that. The Holy Spirit will help you detect if that's being done. And if it's a lot, if it's a pattern, you'll have to seek the Lord on what to do about it. Okay? It doesn't mean, you know, go correct every preacher. But it does mean be careful about the ministry that you're hearing. Because some people are crafty and they handle the Word of God deceitfully. And they try to pull, you know, they use trickery and manipulation to take money from people. Like if, okay, in the next 15 minutes, if you'll bring your offering here, I'll play a, pray a special blessing and you'll get the thousandfold return. God just told me that. Just strange things. And you hear it and it's like, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But then other people are like, oh, well, I better hurry up. I know it makes us all sad to hear of an example, but it's the truth. You know, buy this... Miracle oil from Israel came from an Isra Israeli olive tree. It's ridiculous. And you know it's ridiculous down in here. But if you're a new Christian, you're like, what is this stuff going on? Uh, we wish it didn't go on, but it does. And there's other things that people have done that are deceitful. And so as true Christians and as real preachers, we do everything with the utmost truth. Truth is the very first piece of God's armor mentioned. You have to get to a place of pure honesty in your life about yourself and in your dealings with your fellow man. And until you can do that, oh, you're just behind a wall. You just won't experience the glory of God in your lifestyle. Manifestation of the truth. But my manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Uh, the word for commending there is, is entrusting entrusting ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Doing everything above board, I trust that your conscience will hold me properly. Interesting way to say it. Verse 3, But even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. Mm -hmm. Now we read chapter 3 explained the veil. But if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. That's a uh, a self-initiated veil to those who are perishing. What it means is unbelievers have a veil by choice. Because they won't believe, they're veiled to the truth. 
Verse 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Notice that phrase, whose minds the God of this age, I think the King James says, God of this world, has blinded those minds. The question is, who is the God of this world? Who's the God of this age? I thought God was the God of this world. Do y'all know who Charles Barna is? He takes all these surveys, Christian surveys. Well, one of the questions he asks is to find out who's a believer in God. And the, and the, the quotation or the question is, do you believe that God is the... And he lists a couple things and he says, and is the sovereign ruler of the world today? And it's like, yes, we believe that God is omnipotent and omniscient and He's the sovereign ruler of the world today. And it makes you think like, yes, I believe in that God. But that last phrase in there is not scriptural. God is not the ruler of the world. He has the highest authority in this universe. He's omnipotent and, um, and He's sovereign in the form of having the highest authority but he doesn't have total control, especially of the world. God's not the controller of the world. That's why it's so goofed up. Come on, let's admit it. The world is so goofed up, that's evidence all by itself that God's not doing it. God's not a confusing, chaotic person. He's not a wicked, twisted, messed up, suffering creator. Right. Amen. It's the God of this world that's blinded. God has not blinded people from believing. Right. Amen. Yes, but He's sovereign, so He will cause one to believe and one not to believe. That's not how it works. Oh, that's right. No, the God of this world has blinded people. Satan has put a cloak on top of people who have a hard heart and won't believe the gospel. Amen. Matter of fact, just in case there's a few that aren't sure about this, <clears throat> uh, turn to John with me, chapter 12. The reason I say that is because the trend out there for so many years was, I mean, you could, you could hear this in every church almost every Sunday, that God is in control. And anytime somebody runs up against an obstacle, well, God's in control. Why did this happen? Well, God's in control. Why did this terrible thing happen? Well, God's in control. Nobody knows, but God's in control. And then it got even more religious, and they started saying God is sovereign. And you can hear sovereign and sovereignty in a, in a message, you know, 55 times, and there's not even a scripture that uses the, the phrase. God is sovereign to answer a question. Well, how come this? Well, God is sovereign. Nobody knows. I mean, it's a, myster it's a mystery, but everything happens for a reason, and God is sovereign, and so we usually, God is sovereign, and so it's like this, we don't want to admit, we don't want to talk about anything, but God is sovereign, so we don't have to deal with it. How come this thing happened to you? How come you chose to go down that road? I don't know. I don't know. God is sovereign. It just relieves me of all responsibility. If I can just say God is sovereign, God is sovereign, God is sovereign. Nobody knows anything about anything. Then why are we teaching? Why are we trying to learn anything? The truth is we're trying to learn who God is and what's real and what's not real. And God is sovereign is not an answer for anything except who has the highest authority. A king is sovereign. He has the highest authority in the land. But it doesn't mean he can manipulate everything that happens in the land, nor does he want to. God does not want to finger every single thing that happens. That would be tr training robots. He doesn't do it that way. So, let's prove it just real quick. John chapter 12. If we, if we admit that the devil is the ruler of the world, it sure makes a lot more sense. John chapter 12, verse... 30, Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Or I think the King James says the prince of this world, doesn't it? The prince of this world will be... The ruler of this world or prince of this world will be cast out. Well, that's not God, is it? So who's the ruler of the world? Who's the prince of the world? Satan. Satan is the one in, in control of this world system and this world's attitude, this world's pursuit and this world's uh, destination. Satan is the one that's manipulating people everywhere. Satan, there's so many people who have bowed to the devil and don't know it. 
You know, the devil doesn't make people bow to him. Sure, there's some Satanists that bow to the devil, but that's a small, small sect compared to the rest of the followers of Satan. All right. People bow to Satan. He does, he's a deceiver. He comes as an angel of light. He makes it look like you're just making your own choices. The truth is he's veiled people, deceived people. He's the, ter he's the terrorist of people, but they don't even know it until it's too late, just like a real terrorist. And so he's got people obeying his will without knowing it. He's got people executing his plan, furthering his purposes. Think about all the obscenities and wickedness out there. Think about all the movie script writers. He just got them by the nose. He gives them some wild dream at night and they come write a movie about it, some demonic dream at night, and then they turn it into a Where do you think those images came from? Amen. Came straight from the devil. He's gotten people to worship themselves, humanists, thinking the human is the, the top on the chain. He's gotten people to... Well, I mean, like the Scripture says, that men uh, change the worship of God into the worship of the creation. Rather than worshiping the Creator, worshiping the creation. What's been created? Well, everything. Humans. Some people are worshiping animals. Some people are worshiping the skins of animals. Some people are worshiping earth itself. Where'd that come from? Came from the devil. That's right. Getting getting people to do anything but honor God. That's what the devil does. That's his faith. The devil does not want you to think he's your enemy. That's Our real enemy is the devil. Amen. He doesn't want you to know that though. Right. All he, but what he wants you to do is defy God. Yeah. He, he always trying to get people to defy God. That's really all. It's, it's what it's all about. Defy God. And and hate people too. He wants you to defy God and then be ugly to people. Be selfish toward self and ugly toward people and defy God. That's his whole scheme. Some people want to worship human government. Where do you think that came from? I, I realize that one reason why there's such a big divide in the, in, the, in the country and also the world is because one group wants to worship God and submit to God and think God is the answer for everything. There's another group that wants to think that the government's the answer to everything. We don't need to think the government's the answer to everything because we know God is our answer for everything. True believers in God have a God. We don't need a new God. We don't need an institution. We don't worship what government could do for people. That's not what moves us. That's right. Look at John chapter 14. Just prove this out again real quick. Chapter 14, verse 30. Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming and has nothing in me. There again, he called the devil the ruler of this world. Look at chapter 16. Verse 11 talking about the Holy Spirit, He'll convict the world of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And that's probably good enough. Of course, Ephesians chapter 2 says, calls the devil the prince of the power of the air. The good news for us is that 1 John 2 says, these things I write to you because you have overcome the evil one or the wicked one. You and I have overcome the evil one and the wicked one. He's not our ruler. He's not our ruler. We have escaped the system of the world. We are in the kingdom of God. We have escaped the devil's finger, and we're under the finger of God. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, God has given us the remedy for all devil stuff, and it's the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Go back to 2 Corinthians with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Think about all the unsaved people that you know. The problem, 
Because you're trying to reason with them, and the, what's wrong with these people? They're not in their right mind. Their mind is blinded. In, nobody in their right mind would choose to go to hell. Nobody in their right mind would reject Jesus if they saw the truth. The problem is they're not in their right mind. So what can you do? You help them get in their right mind. How do you do that? You command the darkness off. You command the blindness off. Stop begging God to save people. He's already sent Jesus. Rather, you just help take the cloak off so they can see the light that's shining. Amen. And so in Jesus' name, I rebuke the darkness off of them. You get off of them. You can't have them, Satan. You can't, you can't have them, Satan. That's good. And then just make sure they're getting the gospel somehow and trust that God will get them the gospel and you'll see more results than, oh God, I'm just so sorry. Have them, oh, my, my poor kid, oh God. All that begging God doesn't work. It hasn't worked yet, has it? <laughs> God's heard all those prayers. That's how he's heard all those prayers. Now it's time to say, thank you, God. I cast it all to you. Don't have to pray that anymore. If you could hear him talking, he'd say, I've, I've done all I'm going to do to save that person. Done all I'm going to do. Save that person. Now it's up to believers getting in the gospel and you getting the, helping the darkness get off. <laughs> Final word is God open their heart. Help them see in Jesus' name. And then if you really want your people saved, you're going to have to quit worrying. When you think about the person or, or in prayer deal with it, you can't have any, any burden. Until you can let go, God can't take over. All right, well, that's another message, but here we go. <clears throat> Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine on them. I mean, the light of Jesus is shining. I mean, He's the, sh he's the light of the world. Amen. Verse 5, For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. Notice that first part. We don't preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord. First point is, uh, how would you know if somebody's preaching themselves? Well, just the self-promotion stuff. Uh, the alternative is preaching Christ, where Jesus is exalted. You know, there's so much ministry that goes on these days where you don't even really hear the name of Jesus. It's good stuff. I mean, it's good principles from the Bible, and it does help encourage and sharpen a bit, but it's, it's a lacking sometimes with the name of Jesus or with the person of Christ. The goal... At least here, our goal is always to connect everyone to Christ. He is everything. He's the centerpiece of everything we do. He's the person we all look to as Lord. We've got to get closer. We've got to know the person of Jesus more than the principles. The principles are crucial, but they help connect us to the person. So Jesus has to remain the centerpiece if we're going to have any kind of true revival and true changing of a life, He's everything. Amen. He's the only one to make you happy. Yes. And then He mentions the same thing we've already dealt with in prior chapters. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, are slaves for Jesus' sake. So Paul is a slave to us. I'm a slave to you. You're slaves one to another. Anybody believe in slavery? <laughs> Not natural slavery. Spiritual slavery to the Lord. I'm a slave to Christ. He speaks, I do. And Paul says, ourselves are your slaves. Did you know that preachers are your slaves? I mean, some people actually treat us that way, but. <laughs> Paul said that. He said, I'm yours. Paulo, Apollos and Peter, we're, we're all yours. Everything is ours. I belong to you. You belong to me. You're not, you're not, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Amen. We all belong to one another. Verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Oh, I want to read the passage in John. God commanded light to shine out of darkness. He's shone in our hearts. If you're born again, you can feel it. You can see spiritual light inside you. 
Matter of fact, the moment you get born again, a light starts shining. It's in there. Now, some people are so thick skull, it's like, I'm not sure. It's in there. You, you see some things pretty clearly in there. That's the light of Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. Okay, I have to read John chapter 1. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. That means Jesus was there in the beginning, and it's all made through Him. In Him, Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. So that life of God, which we've learned is Zoe life, God's life, a new word in the New Testament, life, Zoe. That life is the light of men. Amen. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Yeah, that's the unbelievers. Unbelievers didn't understand this gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? It's foolishness to those that aren't saved. How ridiculous. The message is ridiculous. The historical facts are ridiculous. Going to church on Sunday sounds ridiculous to the unsaved. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light that that was the true light that gives light to every man comes into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Okay, I can stop there. You'll have to read the rest of, of the book of John by yourself. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Hallelujah. What treasure? The treasure of this light and this knowledge of the glory? It's in us. It's, it's, it's so wonderful, it's in us. But it's in earthen vessels. Now that refers to like an old cheap clay pot. Literally, that's what it means in the Greek. A cheap clay pot. Could break easily. Kind of like, think about those old red pots you can buy everywhere. And put a plant in them. Cheap, right? Cheap, they could break in a, in a moment. But what do they contain? They, can, they contain something better than itself. That's what we are. So, don't think of yourself in some glory way, yourself is nothing. We lay ourselves to sleep and carry the glory. Amen. You got it? But don't devalue what you're carrying. You may look in the mirror and think, man, you're just a goof. <laughs> man, you've gooped up so much, they might as well call you that. Yeah, the goof is the earthen vessel. But the glory, the light, the knowledge of God is inside you. He put Himself in there. Amen. You're worth so much. Not because of your old self, but because what He put in you. Amen. We have this treasure. you got treasure inside you. So you better treat yourself well. Amen. Don't get mad at yourself. Start beating yourself up. Treat yourself better than that. He put, he, God thought it was okay to put valuable things inside your old clay pot. Glory. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. These are good principles for you to live by. You can be hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. You can be perplexed, but not in despair. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can have a moment where it's like, wow, I didn't expect that. But don't get in despair about it. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I know some of you are singing the song in your head right now. <laughs> That's one reason to sing songs so you remember Scripture. <laughs> Problem is, there's too few songs that have any Scripture in them these days. Paul, you know, he, he's expressing the, the hardship that he faced in spreading the gospel. You, you and I aren't, aren't experiencing that too much. At least not like he did. Everywhere he went, he, had, he feared for his life. People hated him. They tried to kill him a whole bunch of times, whipped him, jailed him. And it was a big deal. He was pressed on every side. A lot different than Americans are today. Mm -hmm. Now, some countries are dealing with this more than others. 
but you can apply this to your little hard-pressed life. You know, the electricity went out at your house. <laughs> The convenience store didn't have my favorite water. <laughs> You'll have to apologize to Paul when you get to heaven. If, if you're a complainer about all little tiny little things in American life, you're going to have to apologize to Paul and Peter and John and Jesus himself. <laughs> they were, they were hard-pressed and not crushed and... So those are good principles, though. Make sure you don't ever feel so uh, persecuted but not forsaken. No matter how bad things get, you're not forsaken. God hasn't forsaken you. Christians haven't forsaken you. Your parents, your friends, your kids, nobody's really forsaken you because you got Jesus and you're okay. Amen. And if you'll just open your heart a little bit, you, you'll, you'll find some Christian love from some Christian brothers and sisters, and it'll make up the difference. Amen. Okay? Amen. Amen. Well, but you got to do this by faith. I mean, you got to believe this stuff by faith. You can't be walking around waiting for somebody to do something for you. You got to go to Jesus and get fixed and say, okay, I'm going to believe this and say them, believe this. And I'm going to get down to verse 13. I'll show you how to do it here. Verse 10, always caring about the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. That's a little complicated in there, but if you, if you just pause and look at it for a moment, you'll see what he's saying. He's saying we're delivered to death for Jesus' sake, meaning all the persecutions and near-death experiences he's having is for the sake of Jesus. And it's producing life in you. Amen. So the apostles who are spreading the gospel are getting killed, but it's bringing life to all those that hear the message. Simple as that. Of course, they have the life of Jesus in them. Paul's expressing how their physical uh, experiences feel like death, but it's giving life. Verse 13, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. That's just a little simple principle he throws in here that's kind of interesting. You can apply it to so many things and really you can apply it to everything related to faith. This is the, there's a spirit of faith. There is the spirit of faith. It's an attitude of faith, an atmosphere of faith. It's a, uh, what does faith look like? There's a spirit of faith. He just has a spirit of joy on him. He has a spirit of peace. You can see it. It's a spirit of faith that can be felt, touched, seen, heard, known. The spirit of faith. It's described succinctly in this way. David said this in Psalms, but here he, Paul repeats it. I believed and therefore I spoke. That's the spirit of faith. I believe something and I say it. That's what faith is. Faith is not some wish. Faith is not throwing salt. Faith is not, I have high hopes. I remember the game, you hear any game show, you watch a game show, and they say, do you have faith that it's going to come out in your favor? Do you have faith for the million dollars? Do you have faith for the little ball to bounce the thing? Do you have faith for the, the suitcase to open up with the And they'll say, I do, I have faith, I have faith. They don't have faith. That's not faith at all. They're, they're not believing anything. They're not believing anything that anybody's promised. They're just wishing real hard. <laughs> Right? It's like if what if a child didn't tell you what they wanted for Christmas, but they believed it. <laughs> they're believing they're going to get this bicycle or this computer or whatever. And, it, and then Christmas comes and they didn't get it. They got socks and <laughs> stuffed animals, but no bike. And Mom, I believed it. What's Mom going to say? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. And I guess I did. No, you didn't. What do you mean I didn't? You never said anything. If, if you don't say it, you're not believing it. That's, that's, not, that's not real faith. That's de that, or we could say it's dead faith. Dead faith doesn't do anything. Dead faith is very sleepy. It doesn't do anything. He, he kind of believed it, but it wasn't a live faith. The spirit of faith believes and speaks. 
All right, so that's the principle for everything. That's how you got saved. Mm -hmm. yes. How'd you get saved? You believed that God raised Jesus from the dead and confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. Right. Salvation comes with the heart and the mouth. Yes. Right? That's how every other miracle comes. Heart, mouth, heart, mouth, heart, mouth. Believe it, say it. Believe it, say it. You can get healed that way. Believe it. Believe what? Any scripture. Mm -hmm. Believe some scripture and say it. That's, right. That's the spirit of faith. Mm -hmm. If you believe it, you'll say it. Exactly. Yes. And, and I'd say you, you'll mean it. Mm -hmm. Like Joni told the story uh, of the, the demon. She told it Sunday, a couple Sundays ago. The demon in Africa that woke her up shaking her bed. And... Joni realizes that there's a demon shaking my bed. Something's going on here. This is wild. And, and, and should I get somebody to help me? You know. And then she realized, no, this is just me and the devil. And so she said, in the name of Jesus, stop. Is that what it was? Stop. Go. In the name of Jesus, go. And the thing didn't go. And maybe she said that a couple times. In the name of Jesus, go. And then she realized, man, this thing's still there. It's still bouncing my bed around. And then she, she felt like she was about to... She said, you know what? I... Something kind of rose up, and she said, I'm going to jump off the bed and, and tear off the sheets, and I'm going, to, I'm going to really tell it. But before she could actually do that, from within her came the spirit of faith. Amen. And she said, in the name of Jesus, go! And she meant it. And the thing left. That's the spirit of faith. The spirit of faith is, pretty quite, is quite dominant. The spirit of faith is quite sincere. It's got that flash in its eyeball. Yes. The spirit of faith just has a different attitude about it. Yes. Yes. Lester Sumrall has a similar bed story. Demon moved his bed all the way away from the wall. And he woke up and he said, put it back. And the devil put it back where it belonged. That's the spirit of faith. The spirit of faith, once it gets in you, see... We want it all to take you over. We want this spirit of faith to take you over so that you don't react like some carnal human. Amen. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Think about what you felt like inside before when news has come. Oh. That, that's not the spirit of faith. That's not the spirit of faith. Oh, oh. Oh, everybody pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. That's not the spirit of faith. But I believe in God. Everybody pray. That's not the spirit of faith. Now, if that's how you feel, you can call as many people as you want. <laughs> but we're trying to help you Amen. grab hold of the spirit of faith or right. uh, catch the spirit of faith from somebody else and say, you know what? That's it. I don't have to be afraid Amen. of something. Right. I can prepare myself ahead of time. Come on. Amen. Smith Wigglesworth had, an, had, a, had a story like that. He woke up in the middle of the night and Satan, he, he knew it was Satan himself standing at the end of his bed. Dark figure had some glowing eyes or whatever. And Smith the Wigglesworth woke up and saw him and said, oh, it's just you. <laughs> and went back to bed. How could you do that? Spirit of faith. What does that mean? I believe that nothing shall by any means hurt me. I'm not afraid of the devil. I know he's out there. Just because he appeared to me doesn't mean I'm supposed to get afraid. All those things have to be settled in you already. And then you can just react that way. Most people would... The spirit of faith is already decided. Already decided. You know, spirit of faith never gets nervous. So if you catch yourself getting nervous, catch yourself. Stop yourself and say, wait. No. No. That's the spirit of faith. I mean, you're going to have a, shout, a little shout there, you know. So the spirit of faith will get miracles for you and nothing else will. Really, the spirit of faith will get miracles for you and nothing else will. You understand? If you haven't seen the spirit of faith in you, you haven't seen any miracles either. Now there's a time when even though you're weak in faith, people that pray for you can help you get your miracle. You with me? So we're not saying that you have to be like that before you get prayed for. Sometimes you don't know how to get there and you're not there yet and that's okay. Just get prayed for and we'll expect the best for you. But in your Christian growth, you're trying to get the spirit of faith on Amen. you. 
You're trying to get the spirit of faith that when a, when a Goliath shows up, you're not afraid of him. You don't tuck tail and run from Goliath. You say, well, just let me, just give me some something. I'll just anything will do. Just stone, little little stones in a slingshot. I can kill the giant. Amen. The spirit of faith is different. You know, David didn't go measure the giant. Well, let me see how tall he might be. Well, this looks pretty intimidating. I don't know. You think we, y'all think we can do this? Y'all think I should do this? Y'all think I should get six stones just in case? If that's the stuff you're going through, you're not in the spirit of faith. So you're going to have to shake all that off. And sh Remember, David shook the armor off. They're like, oh, here, you're going to need this armor. You're going to need... And he couldn't use Saul's armor. He's like, it doesn't fit me. I haven't proved this out. So he just threw off all that stuff somebody was trying to put on him. Yeah. All the solution they were trying to give him. He just said, I come in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, he can't. I come in the name of the God of Israel. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Yeah. Come on, we're, we're Houston Faith Church. You know, that's no accident, okay? We found that the, 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 the funnest thing you can do on earth is live by faith. The funnest life you can ever have is a life lived by faith. A life where you learn, believe, and act. And sure, most of us have lost a couple games, but the season ain't over. Especially as we're learning and growing and stuff, you're going to lose a few games. It's no big deal. No big deal. I'm not going to quit playing because I lost a game. That's right. That's right. I got another game coming. I got another thing coming. I got another giant to kill. I got another another encroachment of the enemy in, in my life or somebody I love's life. I got another thing to do for God. I got another part of the kingdom to build. I got another person to save. I got, an, I got something to do here. Come on. So I'm going to throw off all the stuff where I wasn't quite in the spirit of faith and man, I'm going to jump up taller next time and I'm going to force my, I'm going to force my will. Yes. Amen. Which would be the same as enforcing God's will. Yes. You have a will to live. You have a will to succeed. You have a will to prosper. You have a will to be okay. Find a scripture and enforce God's will concerning the matter. That's right. Right. The more you know God's will, the, the easier it is to feel like you're in it. Right you have to know His will for you is to succeed. Right. We read last week that He, he always causes us to triumph Hallelujah. in Christ. If you know that He always causes you to triumph, now I can enforce my will and God's will because they're the same. Amen. How many wants to triumph? Amen. How many of you want to lose? Nobody wants to lose? Everybody wants to win? God says I'll always cause you to win. Yeah. Step into those shoes. Begin to see yourself that way. I'm more than a conqueror. Matter of fact, I'm not even just a conqueror. I am more than that. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit, helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.